Hello everyone and welcome back to the second part of our genetics and evolution lecture. So in the first lecture we've discussed the Mendelian concepts. We went over the principle of gene mapping based on the frequency of um, crossovers or recombinations between two genes. And we also discussed mutations, different type of mutations, gene mutations versus chromosome mutations that can affect genetic variability. Now in this lecture, I would like to continue talking about different factors that can affect genetic variability, whether they are from errors or whether they are from population genetic effects, like for instance, genetic drift, talk about more analytical methods, like for instance, Hardy-Weinberg principle and test cross, and then finally, go over the evolutionary concepts, like for instance, natural selection, speciation, as well as evol the definition of evolutionary time. And then finally, we will go over some practice question before we conclude this video. So continuing on with factors that can affect genetic variability. One other factor that can cause genetic variability in offspring is error during meiosis. And that this type of error that is referred to as non-disjunction is from failure of either the homologous chromosomes or the sister chromatids to separate properly from each other during meiosis. So if you recall, we mentioned how during prophase we have homologous chromosomes being lined up. And then during meiosis 1, what happens is that these homologous chromosomes will separate from each other. And then during meiosis 2, the sister chromatids will separate from each other. Okay? Now if there is error, and for instance, in meiosis 1, instead of separating the two homologous chromosomes, they both go to one size. That would be an example of non-disjunction. Or let's say meiosis 1 happens properly, but then during meiosis 2, one half of the sister chromatids separate properly, but then the other half all segregate together. That would be another example of non-disjunction. And it would be problematic because presence of an extra chromosome can cause different problems. Like for instance, Down syndrome, which is from presence of three copies of uh, chromosome 21. So that would be problematic. So here I've shown you that there could be two types of non-disjunction. The first one that happens during meiosis 1. So these two cells that have no chromosome, no chromosome 21 at all. So here let's talk about Down syndrome for instance. These gametes will not survive because they don't have any chromosome 21. However, the other two gametes will have two copies. So there is an extra copy. And once this egg combines, combines with a sperm that has another chromosome 21, a combination would be one chromosome from male, two from female, so it would be a trisomy. As a consequence of which, these progenies will have three copies of chromosome 21, that is Down syndrome. Another way of having uh, non-disjunction is during meiosis 2. So during meiosis 1 here you can see that homologous chromosomes have properly segregated from each other. Here on this half also sister chromatids properly segregated. So these eggs will yield normal progenies. However on the other side there was a non-disjunction. So half of these gametes will be non-viable because they don't have any chromosome and the other half since they have an extra copy once they are combined with the sperm, they would give rise to three copies of chromosome 21. So this gamete, if it um, yields a progeny, that would be an example of Down syndrome. Now other causes of genetic variation is mispairing. So we know how gasset, so that's my memory aid that I've shown you in our reproduction and mitosis and meiosis video. So we discussed how we have purines are always pairing or at least are supposed to always pair with pyrimidines. And to be more specific, G pairs with C and A pairs with T. But in reality, there could be some mispairing that is going on. And for instance, a purine pair with another purine. Like for instance, we could have AA pairing, or there could be G, 
G pairing. So these are examples of aberrant pairing. Alternatively, we could have aberrant pairing between purine and pyrimidine. Like for instance, A could pair with C, and that would be again another mispairing that could change the content of our DNA. And this mispairing event happens during DNA replication where a wrong nucleotide is being incorporated. Now, we could have a perfect DNA, but then the protein products could still be um, defective or have problem. And the reason for that is that DNA transfers its genetic material to RNA through the transcription process. And then RNA through the translation process with the help of the ribosomes and tRNA yields protein. And then here I should have mentioned that this is mRNA or messenger RNA and here we have RNA polymerase. Now these processes are not perfect. There is a chance of an error. In fact there is a chance of one error in every 10 to the power 4 to 10 to the power 5 transcription event. Or with the translation there is one chance of one error in every 10 to the power 4 translation event. So we could still have a protein that have a different function from what the DNA was intending to code. All right, so these are examples of transcription and translation error. And then in the previous lecture, we discussed how mutations could be advantageous or they could be deleterious. They could also be neutral, not having any effect. For instance, if we have a silent mutation, that would be neutral. It will not cause any problem. Okay, so now let's discuss again the difference. So advantageous mutations are having a new function that will increase survival of the species in the population. And so therefore, the advantageous mutations are usually undergoing positive selection and the frequency of these um, genes will increase over time. So let me, let me give you an example. Let's say that for argument's sake that there is a human that develops a mutation that makes him invulnerable to cancer. He no longer develops cancer. This mutation increases survival of this person because now he has a healthy lifespan. Um, he doesn't develop cancer. His progenies, if they have that gene mutation, they would also not develop cancer. So he has better chance of survival to the rest of us who can develop cancer. So this is as an example of positive selection. On the other hand, these, some of these mutations could be deleterious where there would be reduction in the survival of those individuals who carry this mutation. Let's say, for instance, we have a mutation that increases risk of cancer. This would decrease survival of those individuals. So negative selection will act on this mutation and over time this mutation is usually eliminated okay because those individuals won't survive and won't have any progenies to pass on the gene the other terminology i'd like you to know is inborn errors of metabolism and basically um, these are referred to mutations that affect metabolism And one example is the disease phenylketonuria. Phenylketonuria. And so normally phenylalanine is converted to thyrosine with the help of the phenylalanine hydroxylase enzyme. Now if there is mutation in this phenylalanine hydroxylase, there would be accumulation of phenylalanine in these patients as a consequence of which there would be brain problems or in other words cerebral dysfunction. And so this is an example of inborn error of metabolism where mutations has changed the metabolism. Next, I would like to go over the definition of mutagens and carcinogens. So basically, mutagens are referring to any environmental agents like chemicals, radiation, or, or viruses that cause mutations in a DNA. Carcinogens, on the other hand, are referring to the environmental factors or chemicals or radiation or whatever factor that can cause cancer. And in fact, there is a positive correlation 
between increased rate of mutagenesis and cancer development. So the higher the rate of the DNA mutation, the higher the rate of cancer development. And so basically cancer is having cells that have uncontrolled growth. So there is no break preventing them from growing and dividing. And in order for that to happen, cancer cells have certain features. And those include number one, they are self-sufficient in production of growth hormones as well as cell surface receptors that mediate abnormal growth and cell division. These cancer cells are also, as we just discussed, there is no break in preventing them from cell division and growth. So these cancer cells are insensitive to anti-growth signals. They can avoid apoptosis which as we just discussed apoptosis which which as we just discussed in a separate video is a cell program death that is induced by the body so once the body sees that a cell is abnormal it will give it a signal to okay it's time for you to die but cancer cells can avoid apoptosis and then the other feature is that these cells are immortal because they have the telomerase enzyme and so most cells in the body they have a finite uh, they can undergo through a finite number of cell divisions because with every division their telomere keeps getting shorter and shorter until they can no longer divide with certain immortal cells like for instance germline cells stem cells as well as cancer cells they have this enzyme called telomerase that will prevent their telomere from shortening. So therefore now they can undergo unlimited number of replications. So here there could be unlimited number of replications. And then the final feature is that these cells, number five, they acquired angiogenesis. So they're able to create new vessels for the tumor that is growing to help it with its feeding and they can also initiate tissue invasion so they can break open the basement membrane and spread to different parts of the body whether they spread from invading the local tissues or spreading through the lymph nodes or through the blood to different sites of the body these cancer cells can develop tissue invasion properties and this is referred to as metastasis now, one other point that I would like to mention is that not necessarily all cancer agents are causing mutations. And so therefore, carcinogens are divided into two categories. They are either mutagenic, meaning that they are caused by inducing DNA damage, or they are non-mutagenic. They cause cancer without causing mutation. And so let's go over the, the differences between mutagenic and non-mutagenic. So the mutagenic carcinogens can affect either the oncogenes or tumor suppressor genes. So the normal form of the oncogenes is called proto-oncogene. And the function of these genes is to promote cell growth and mitosis. However, if there is a mutation in these proto-oncogenes, then they would turn into oncogenes that increase their expressivity and therefore lead to cancer. And usually a mutation in one copy of these genes is enough to induce cancer. And so therefore, these are examples of dominant mutations. On the other hand, we have tumor suppressor genes, and these are examples of genes that prevent cell growth. They induce some break on the cell growth, example of which include, for instance, P53 and retinoblastoma gene. Now, there has to be mutations in both of these genes, both alleles, in order for tumor suppressor gene to lose its effect. So this is an example of recessive gene mutation. So from loss of the function, now there would be increase risk of cancer development. 
because these genes are no longer around to place a break on the growth of these cells and so cancer can, can, can develop. Now examples of non-mutagenic carcinogens, basically these uh, carcinogens are not causing DNA mutation directly, like for instance alcohol is an example of a non-mutagenic carcinogen. And how alcohol can cause cancer is that it increases rate of cell mitosis as a consequence of which these cells now have reduced time and less opportunity in order to repair any DNA damage. So DNA damage now over time can accumulate and lead to cancer. But alcohol itself has not been causing any mutation in the DNA. It just increased the rate of the cell division. So this is an example of a non-mutagenic carcinogen. Next, I'd like to move on to population genetics. Okay, so basically population genetics is the uh, study of the changes in the distribution of alleles in a certain population. So this is study of the changes in distribution of alleles in a population. And there are many different factors that can affect population genetics and these include for instance random mutations. Okay, any one of us can have a random mutation that over time affects the population genetics. There could also be natural selection. Let's say that there is a new flu virus that develops that kills most of the population that we live in, but there are some of us that are resistant to it because we have certain genes that help us to survive. So this is an example of nat natural selection that an event comes in, it wipes out part of the population, the ones that are resistant survive. And so consequently, the genetics, the distribution of alleles in that population changes. Another example is genetic drift, which is basically random fluctuations in the population gene variants. So genetic drift is random fluctuations in population alleles. And these are basically happening by chance and it's more pronounced it's more pronounced in small population because think of it if you're starting with a population that has only 10 uh, parental population is the size of it. Any fluctuation, any genetic drift in the uh, genetics of these 10 people will have significant effect if we look down the population 100 years from now. Versus if you're looking at a population that has like um, 1 billion individuals in that population, some random fluctuations in the population gene won't really have a huge effect. So genetic drift is most pronounced or most affected in small populations. Other examples of phenomena that affect population genetics, for instance, is gene flow, where genes are flowing from one population to another. So let's say people that have migrated from all over the world to US, we have gene flow to US. So that's one other example. And then selective mating. If individuals in one population have preference to mate with certain individuals with certain features, again, that could affect the uh, distribution of alleles in that population. Now, what is founder effect? Basically here I have shown you an, a nice image that shows you um, the phenomenon of the founder effect. This is an extreme example of genetic drift, okay, where a new population starts to grow in a new environment and this new growth is by starting with a small number of individuals. As a consequence of which now there will be a huge loss of genetic variation. So here, look at these ladybugs for instance. If one of them somehow is carried out by a wind to an island that there is no other ladybugs and it starts a new population, all of these ladybugs would be red, which is different from their parental population. So this is an example of founder effect. So a higher frequency of a specific gene in a population is founded by a small ancestral group that has started to um, establish a new population in a new environment. 
The next phenomenon is natural selection, which is basically the process through which environmental factors act on a population to fa uh, favor certain alleles over the others. Like for instance, environmental factors that can cause cancer favor individuals that have tumor suppressor genes over those who don't. So this is an example of natural selection. And there are three requirements in order for natu natural selection to happen. One, there has to be variation among traits. Okay, so in other words, in order for natural selection to happen and one individual survive versus the other one that doesn't survive, there has to be variation among traits. For instance, the individual that has survived has to have a better genes. It's not like they are both identical and the natural selection picks one over the other. No, there must be variation among traits. Number two, there has to be ability to pass on trait to next generation. So we just discussed how one person that had better chance of survival against cancer has been picked positively selected by natural selection and didn't die. But then that gene has to be able to be passed on to the next generation. Otherwise, if it's not able to be passed on, natural selection cannot help survival of progenies of that individual. So in order for natural selection to happen, those traits needs to be able to be passed on to the next generation in order for that population to survive and take over that population genetics. And then finally, there has to be alterations in survival or reproductive ability of individuals that carry the trait. So as we just discussed, the trait, this trait has to somehow help with either survivor or increase the reproductive ability of those individuals in order to um, uh, be positively selected by natural selection and passed on to the next generation. Next, I'd like to discuss how natural selection can act on quantitative traits. So quantitative traits I'm referring to here, like for instance, height of an individual or the beak size. So there could be three different ways that natural selection can affect quantitative traits. The first mode is called stabilizing selection, where natural selection favors average individuals. So here you can see that the population phenotype is falling close to the average and consequently there would be a reduction in the variation in the population. So here with stabilizing selection, average individuals are favored. On the other hand, we can have directional selection where there would be variation from mean in one direction. For instance, small beak size could be favored or we could have directional selection in the opposite side where large beak size could be um, favored. So again, this would be variation from mean. That is in only one direction. And then if you have variation from mean that is in both directions, that would be an example of disruptive selection. And so in this example, for instance, both the large beak size and small beak size are preferred over average beak size. And uh, this type of selection, disruptive natural selection, increases variation in population in a bimodal distribution pattern. So here you can see that we have two humps right here. So this is an example of bimodal distribution pattern. Next, we have the speciation process through which one species evolves into a new organism that can no longer interbreed with the original population in order to yield fertile offsprings. So speciation is where one species evolve into a new organism that can no longer breed with the original species in order to yield fertile um, organisms. And one example that I can give you is that imagine that we have a population of snake in Europe 
and another population of snake in United States. So there are two separate continents and assume that there is no gene flow. No one is moving these snakes around. So over millions of years, natural selection will affect these two species. There would be mutations that build up. There would be different um, phenomenon that happens on them that separates these two species from each other. And so therefore, a new organism will develop from every one of them. This would be an example of speciation. And so over millions of years, you'll notice that these two snakes can no longer interbreed with each other because they have evolved into a new species. Now, factors that can uh, attribute to the uh, process, of, process of speciation include, for instance, polymorphism, where there would be variation in the phenotypes within the same population. Like, for instance, there would be difference in the uh, color of the eye. There would be blue versus brown versus green eye colors. So this is presence of two or more different phenotypes in the same population. The next phenomenon that attributes to speciation is adaptation, where this is the process that natural selection acts on a population in order to select for advantageous genes. So here is where natural selection will promote survival of advantageous genes. Or in other words, it will promote selection of advantageous genes. The next phenomenon that leads to speciation is specialization, where certain traits or behaviors are adopted by members of a species in order to survive better in a certain environment. And one example is, for instance, um, Japanese honeybees that are being surrounded by a large population of Asian hornets. And so anytime a hornet enters the nest of these um, Japanese honeybees, these honeybees will surround the hornet, start to vibrate in order to increase the temperature of hornet that leads to its death. On the other hand, European honeybees, they don't have this behavior as a consequence of which they are defenseless against Asian hornets. So this is one example of specialization where there is adaptation of traits or behaviors by species in order to better survive in a specific environment. environment. The next phenomenon that leads to speciation is bottleneck which is basically a catastrophic environmental change that caused all of a sudden a sudden change in the population size as a consequence of which the genes that remain will be completely altered. And so from here on, the new population can have a completely different gene pool from the original one. So here I've shown you an example of uh, genetic bottleneck. So imagine that in the parental population, something happens that most of them die and only a handful of these individuals survive. Now these individuals will continue to grow and then the new population will have only their genes. And the gene pool of this new population is completely different from the original one. And this increases chance of speciation. So I'd like to remind you the difference between bottleneck versus founder effect. With the founder effect, the original population is not affected. It's just that some of the uh, individuals from original population has moved to a separate area and started a new population. With the bottleneck, most of the genes in the original population are being disrupted and destroyed, and only a handful of them are survive. As a consequence of which, the um, new generation will have a different gene pool compared to the other one. So that's an important difference between genetic bottleneck and founder effect. And finally, inbreeding is one other event that can uh, increase chance of speciation. And the reason for that is that um, 
inbreeding is actually increasing risk of accumulation of random mutations as a consequence of which over time the species can separate. There is a higher chance that these two species will, will evolve into new organisms. So, so far we've discussed different factors that attribute to the uh, increased chance of speciation. Now there are some factors that uh, that can prevent and decrease risk of speciation and these include for instance outbreeding or migration like those snake population that we just discussed if there has been migration or there has been outbreeding between those snake population their genes will continue to mix and those species will never separate from each other same happens with humans humans keep on migrating from one continent to the other and the genes continue to mix with each other. Therefore, there is not a chance that, let's say, humans in U.S. Uh, speciate and evolve into a different organisms from the ones that are found in Australia, for instance. If we stop migration and outbreeding, over millions of years, yes, it's possible that new organisms develop. But with the fact that humans keep on moving around and migrating and outbreeding, therefore, all of them remain as the same species. The next phenomenon is evolution, where environmental factors and predation place pressures on species to evolve into new organisms. And there are three different modes of evolution. The first one is parallel evolution, where two parental species will evolve independent of each other, but they will maintain the same level of similarity because they are both in, within the same environment that requires similar uh, survival skills. And one example here is, for instance, sugar glider versus flying squirrel. Both of them have developed from a common ancestor that have develop the same feature which is flying because they need this ability to jump from one tree to another in order to survive. The other mode of evolution is divergent evolution where over time morphological differences between two species continue to increase and increase because they, are, uh, because they need to adapt to different um, environmental factors. And one example is like for instance all mammals if you look at them the bones in their arms and their hands have developed into different shapes which is for what they need to do for instance humans they need to use their hands for um, moving stuff around versus bat needs to use them for flying so they have adopted different shapes so that's an example of divergent evolution where parental species started to develop different features and then one other form of evolution is convergent evolution where two different species start to develop similar features in order to adapt to a similar ecological condition like for instance bats and birds both of them have adopted a similar shape of wings so let's not confuse convergent with parallel evolution with parallel evolution a common ancestor gives rise to different species with the same properties versus with the convergent evolution two different ancestors here one is a bird the other is a mammal gives rise to features that are required for survival for in, in this instance for example um, the shape of the wings in order to help with flying so that concludes discussion of different modes of evolution parallel evolution divergent evolution versus convergent evolution then moving on to molecular clock can you tell me, based on this graph, what is molecular clock? So based on this hypothesis, the rate of the DNA or protein sequence evolution is constant over time. So if proteins are evolving at a constant rate, therefore we can estimate based on the, on the differences in protein structure of different species, how far, how long ago these two species have separated from each other. So here you can see that the genomic dif difference increases over time. So if we see two species that have a very similar protein structure, then that tells us that, oh, it hasn't been long ago, maybe a million years ago, these two species have separated from each other. Versus if you see two species that have a lot different uh, features, like let's say, for instance, here you see bat versus birds, a lot of different features in this situation okay maybe a hundred million years ago because now the, their protein sequence is more different compared to the original one that we were discussing
Okay, so one more time, the rate of DNA or protein sequence evolution is constant over time. So therefore, considering that proteins are evolving at a constant rate, therefore now we can estimate the dates that species have undergone evolution and diverged from each other. And so in other words, molecular clock is telling us that evolutionary time could be correlated with the change in genotype. So if the genotype of two species is a lot different, then it means that these two species have separated from each other many years ago. Versus if two species like chimpanzee and humans have a very similar genotype, therefore these two species probably didn't separate from each other many, many years ago. All right, so that's the basis of the molecular clock. The next topic, is Hardy-Weinberg principle, which I find it very fun to review. And I love to go over the questions with the Hardy-Weinberg principle. So basically Hardy-Weinberg helps us predict the allele or the genotype frequency in a population. But in order to do that, we have to assume certain assumptions. And those include number one, in that population, we have to assume that individuals are having random mating. There is there shouldn't be any selective mating or that would deviate the Hardy-Weinberg principle. Number two, we have to assume that there is no net migration that would affect the gene pool. We have to assume that there won't be any mutations again that would affect the gene pool. And then finally, there won't be any selective forces that would affect the gene pool. So no selection. So if we have these assumptions in place, then Hardy-Weinberg principle can help us predict the allele or gene frequency in a population. So if we have a dominant allele that is shown as P and then a recessive allele that is shown as a Q, according to Hardy-Weinberg principle, if that's the only two alleles that we have, then their sum should be equal to 100% in a population because that's the only combination that we have. So instead of writing 100%, I would like to write P plus Q equals one. And then if this is one combination of alleles that we have, and then we multiply that by another combination of alleles. So this is sperm, for instance, multiplied by an egg. We would like to find out what type of genotypes we will have in that population. So the answer would be P to the power two plus QP plus PQ plus Q2. Or in other words, it's equal, our genotype of this population is equal P2 plus 2PQ plus Q2. And so this genotype constitutes 100% of the genotype within our population. So this value is equal 100% or equal to 1. So now we can summarize the finding. According to the Hardy-Weinberg equation, the allele frequency P plus Q is equal to one, and then the genotype in a population is P to the power two plus two PQ plus Q2 equals to one. And then this Q2 and P2, these are our homozygous individuals. Versus two PQ is our heterozygous individuals. All right. So now with that information in mind, let's go over and do some practice questions. So we have a yellow P color that is dominant over green P color. So yellow P color, we show it as let's say value P while we show the green P color as our recessive allele and show it as Q. And then the scientists isolate thousand P's from a garden and find that 90 of them are green. So they already told us that Q2, 90 individuals from 1,000 are Q2. How many of these P's are heterozygous? So it's basically asking of how many of these individuals have a PQ genotype. In other words, what's the value for 2PQ? So in order to solve this question, let's write the two equation for Hardy-Weinberg. Dominant allele plus the recessive allele is equal to one. And then regarding the genotypes, P2 plus 2PQ plus Q2 should also be equal to one. 
So we already have one value right here. Q to the power 2 is equal 90 divided by 1000, which is equal to 0 0.09. So solving for Q, we find out that Q is equal 0 0.3. So if Q value is equal to 0 0.3, what would be the value for P here? We know that their sum should be equal to 1. So P is equal to 0 0.7. So let me summarize these findings. Here we have P is equal to 0 0.7 and Q is equal to 0 0.3. So therefore, our P2 value is equal to 0 0.49, our Q2 value is equal, we already knew, 0 0.09, and our 2PQ is 2 times 0 0.7 times 0 0.3 equals 0 0.42. Now if you multiply each of these values by the population that we have here, 1,000, it would tell us how many individual in that, that population would have that specific genotype. So 1,000 by uh, multiplied by 0 0.49, so P2 population is 490. 1,000 times 0 0.09, Q2 is equal 90, and we already knew that from the question. And then finally, 2PQ is equal 1,000 times 0 0.42, is 420. And if you add up all these values, it adds up to the number 1000. And so here I'm providing you with a drawing that actually summarizes all the findings here. So there we go. So we already discussed the alleles that P plus Q times P plus Q equals to 1. So this is what is showing you here. P and Q on one side of the box times P by Q. And so we have P2, Q2, and then two PQs. And once you solve for these values, you will find out that uh, we have 0 0.49 for P2, 0 0.42 for two PQ, and 0 0.9 for Q2. The next concept is biometry, which refers to the application of mathematics and statistics in order to solve biological components. So let me give you an example. Let's say that you toss a coin 100 times and 49 times you get head and 51 times you get tail. Does it mean that this coin had higher chance of having tail than head? No, it's just by chance that uh, there was a higher number when you toss it. Now, if you repeat this process one more time, toss the same coin another 100 times, this time you may get head 52 times versus tail, you may get 48 times here. So there are subtle variations that can happen by chance. And the purpose of this biometric or statistical methods is to find out any difference that we see is it due to chance or is it real? And so in order to do that, we use different tests called t-test, which compares the mean for two groups. So it compares the mean for two groups. Or we can use ANOVA, which stands for analysis of variance, which compares the mean for more than two groups. And these tests can tell us if the uh, variation is it due to chance or is it a real difference. So you might have noticed if you refer to some scientific journals, you may see some graph bars that are showing error bars there that could mean different things. It could mean standard deviation or standard error of the mean. And then on top of that, you may see a star. That star is telling you statistical information, and it basically tells you um, the probability that this difference has happened by chance. For instance, if you see that underneath in the description, it writes that with this star P is equal to 0 0.01, it tells you that there is only probability of 1% that this finding has happened by chance. In other words, if you repeat this experiment 100 times, there is only one time chance that this happens, okay? so in uh, by logical systems, any time we have a p-value that is less than 0 0.05, it means less than 5%, then 
that's the time that we assume that, okay, this is probably a real difference. And this difference that we see in values is not due to chance. So just keep that in mind because some MCAT examiners may throw this statistical analysis at you. And so you may see a graph that doesn't have the star. So these two graphs, there's no difference versus another graph could have a star and tells you the P value. So then you know that there is a real difference between these two values. All right, so we are basically done with the content of this lecture. I just would like to answer two uh, short questions and then move on to the practice questions after that. So the first question is, what's the difference between transition and transversion mutations? Okay, so basically with transition mutations, purines replace purines or pyrimidines replace primidines. So remember, we had gas set. These two were purines. And then these two were pyrimidines. So with transitions, G converts to A or A converts to G. So that's an example of transition. Or C converts to C T or T converts to C. So these are examples of transitions where purines remain purines and pyrimidines remain pyrimidines. Versus with the transversion, a purine converts to pyrimidin or the other way around. Pyrimidins convert to purines. The next question is, what are teratogens? So these are substances that can cause physical defect in a developing embryo. So physical defect in a developing embryo. And we just discussed in our embryology lecture that organogenesis, which means the development of organs, happens between third to eight weeks of gestation as a consequence of which it's between three to eight weeks that usually fetus is very prone to developing organ problems from exposure to teratogens all right so now let's move on to some practice questions i'm going to read these for you if you need more time please go ahead and pause the video in a population comprised of 1000 members 250 individuals exhibit a recessive trait so here we are having another example of Hardy-Weinberg equation. What percentage of these individuals will have homozygous dominant genotype? Okay. The next question is, which of the following evolutionary processes describes the presence of receptors on human cell surface that is recognized with a newly emerged deadly virus? The next question is, which of the following statements is true regarding tumor suppressant genes and proto-oncogenes? Which of the following diagrams correctly describes the molecular clock hypothesis? And then, a patient is diagnosed with myoclonic epilepsy, which is a mitochondrial disorder. Remember, mitochondrial disorders are only being transmitted from mothers. So which of the following pedigrees most likely be belongs to this patient? And then the final question is, half of a plant population has a homozygous genotype and the other half has a heterozygous genotype. So P2 plus Q2 is equal to 0.5 and 2PQ is also equal to 0.5. Assuming that this population remains at Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, what would be the percentage of heterozygous plants after two rounds of inbreeding. Okay, so if you need more time, please go ahead and pause the video. Otherwise, let's start with the first question. In a population comprised of 1,000 members, 250 individuals exhibit a recessive trait. So Q2 is equal 250 divided by 1,000, meaning that it's equal to 0 0.25. And so therefore, Q is equal to 0 0.5. So if we write the Hardy-Weinberg equations, P plus Q should be equal to 1. And then P2 plus Q2 plus 2PQ should also be equal to 1. We already know that Q is equal to 0 0.5. Therefore, P is also equal to 0 0.5. Now the question is asking, what's the percentage of patients that have a homozygous dominant genotype. So here we are asking what's the P2 population. So P to the power 2 is 0 
And so the answer is 25% will have homozygous dominant genotype. If the question was asking how many of this population has heterozygous phenotype, then the answer would have been 2PQ, which is 2 times 0 0.5 times 0 0.5. That would have been 50%. And we already know that the population of homozygous recessive genotype is 25%. So here you can see that they all add up. 25% homozygous dominant, 25% homozygous recessive, and then 50% is um, uh, heterozygous. So all of them add up to 100% or 1. The next question is, which of the following evolutionary processes describes the presence of receptors on a human cell surface that is recognized with a newly emerged deadly virus? So one example is like, for instance, HIV virus. It's a fairly new virus. Uh, if you look back a thousand years ago, there was no HIV, but there has been a new mutation in the virus that is now uh, recognizing human receptors. So let's see which of these phenomena best explain this finding. So convergence evolution of a virus and cell receptors. No, basically convergence evolution tells us that they've developed the same property. We are not talking here about the same property. We are talking about the virus attacking a receptor. Genetic bottleneck favoring rare viruses that recognize cell receptors. Again, that wouldn't be correct because this virus was never around. We are talking about a new virus that has developed. Positive natural selection favors random mutations of the virus. That's correct. This virus has developed a new mutation, random mutations, that now makes it able to attack human immune cells. And so this virus has now a better survival because it can spread around. So that's an example of positive natural selection. And the negative natural selection favoring cell receptors that are recognized by the virus. If it was negative natural selection, then those humans would have been died, right? It wouldn't have been spreading. So that wouldn't be a correct answer. The next question is, which of the following statements is true regarding tumor suppressor genes and proto-oncogenes? So, decrease their expression and promote cancer. No, that's incorrect. We just described how mutations enhance the activities of these proto-oncogenes as a consequence of which there is more growth and cell division. Tumor suppressor genes promote apoptosis. That is correct because these tumor suppressor genes we just discussed, it place breaks on a cell growth and division. So it can also induce uh, and promote apoptosis, which is a programmed cell death. Proto-oncogenes code for DNA repairing enzymes, and that is the definition of tumor suppressor genes. Proto-oncogenes uh, express the growth factors. And then finally, mutations of proto-oncogenes often lead to the loss of function followed by a cellular transformation. So it's more with the uh, tumor suppressor genes that there is a loss of function if there is mutation in both genes. With proto-oncogenes, there is a gain of function because a single mutation has made the gene to add in, to, to develop a new function and become more active. So therefore, choice D would also be incorrect, and choice B would be the correct answer. Which of the following diagrams describes the molecular clock hypothesis? So we just discussed how as time goes by, the genetic diversity increases. So this is how the graph was showing. And so therefore, choice B would be the correct answer. The next question is, which of the following pedigrees will show um, the pattern of uh, inheritance for a mitochondrial disorder? So we just discussed how with mitochondrial disorders, it's only the mother that can transmit the gene to the next progenies. And so if you look in all these examples here, if a diseased father has transmitted a disease gene, so A is not a correct answer. Uh, here, the disease gene is only seen in males. And so this seems to be an X-linked disorder. And so therefore, this is also not the correct answer. In this example, also we see that there has been no um, disease in this progeny but it has been transmitted to the next progeny. So this is an example of autosomal recessive uh, gene. And finally, we get to choice C, where the mother has transmitted the disease to all the progenies. 
and then this mother also transmitted to all the progenies and so does the next mother so this is an example of a mitochondrial disorder and if you notice the father here even though he is affected but since we don't get our mitochondria from father doesn't affect the children so choice c would be the correct answer and then choice a to be more specific is an example of an autosomal dominant mutation where the mother has affected certain uh, individuals in the population and then that generation also continue to affect the next generation moving on to the final question half of a plant population has a homozygous genotype so we know that p2 plus q2 since only affects a half a population is equal 0 0.5 and the other half has a heterozygous genotype so even if it didn't tell us this information we should have already deducted that 2 pq is equal to 0 0.5 Assuming that this population remains at Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, what would be the percentage of heterozygous plants after two rounds of inbreeding? All right, so we know that P plus Q is equal to 1, and then P2 plus 2PQ plus Q2 is also equal to 1. Now, solving for this equation, we will see that the value for P and Q is equal to 0.5 because 0 0.5 to the power 2 is equal to 0 0.25 and then 0 0.5 to the power 2 is 0 0.25 their sum is equal to 0 0.5 on the other hand 2 times 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 gives us the value of 0 0.5 so if you solve for these equations you find out that p is equal to 0 0.5 and then q is equal to 0 0.5 so now if we have p2 plus 2pq plus q2 let's see what percentage of our population here would be heterozygous so we just discussed 25 percent homozygous dominant 25 percent homozygous recessive and then 50 percent is heterozygous now if you're talking about two rounds of inbreeding these would be true bred so they would continue to be p2 and q2 but here we have to see what happens to this population once they undergo inbreeding so pq times pq it would give, give us p to the power 2 it would give us q to the power 2 and it will give us 2 pq so we have p2 q2 pq and qp okay so in this population only half of our uh, progenies are having a, a heterozygous phenotype. So the 50% value has dropped now to 25% are heterozygous. Now, if you repeat the same phenomenon again, PQ times PQ, you will get only half of this population would be heterozygous. So here, and instead of capital Q, I should have used lowercase q so here again pq times pq gives us p2 qp pq and then q2 so only 50 percent of this population would be heterozygous so again 25 percent divided by 2 12.5 percent so after two rounds of inbreeding the number of heterozygous plants dropped to 12.5 percent all right, so that concludes our discussion of this video. We have covered all the topics that are listed here. Uh, and these topics, again, are very closely matching to the topics that are listed on the actual AAMC website. So thank you all for listening, and we will see you for the next video.